In this video, we're going to discuss the recent collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and what we should take away from this occurrence and what we should ignore. We're also going to discuss the increase in number of ongoing cyber attacks that we're experiencing right now and what that means for our future. Stick around to the end where I'll also tell you about the foods that you're going to see a shocking spike in price on this year. Spoiler alert, it's not looking good for Easter. I'll also have another giveaway and announce last week's winner. Now, before we delve into the details, it's essential to clarify the purpose of these videos to provide you with practical guidance to help you with really giving you relevant information that's going to help inform your preparedness decisions. But remember, if you're feeling overwhelmed, our library of how-to videos really offers detailed information and solutions for uncertain times. And look, while we can't control global challenges, fortifying our environments really enhances our resilience. And additionally, stick around to the end as I'll share some preparedness updates that I'm personally working on. Also, one other housekeeping note. We've picked up some sponsors here recently on the channel, which we're going to introduce in future videos, including this one. I'll share at the end of the video why we're doing this. But long story short, I'm beginning to shop land. I've been doing that off and on for the last few years, but I'm doing it in earnest now to build an off-grid setup and to document the process here on the channel. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of costs that's associated with land, the equipment, and everything else that goes with this endeavor. So we're gonna utilize the revenue from the sponsors to fund these projects, which we'll use on this channel to teach. But again, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the news that you need to know. Infrastructure failures. Whenever we witness infrastructure failures like the collapse of the Baltimore Bridge or the container ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal in 2021, it really shows how fragile the systems are that we rely upon. So what are the problems? Well, first, there are the obvious ramifications of a massive bridge blocking ship traffic in and out of what was rapidly becoming one of the rebounding success stories as one of America's largest ports. Now, in 2023, the port to Baltimore ranked first in the nation for importing goods such as passenger vehicles, plywood, paper products, construction equipment, metals like aluminum and zinc, and agricultural products like animal feed preparation. Now, in terms of exports by weight, it topped the nation in tractors, commercial vehicles, poultry harvesting machinery, self-propelled construction machinery, and industrial vehicles such as cranes and derricks. Now, however, its primary export was coal, outweighing that of any other port by five times. All total, the port accounted for $80 billion in two-way trade. And with a massive investigation underway and donning but likely lengthy cleanup, and salvage operation that's still in the future, the port is now out of commission for the foreseeable future. And this will first impact the 15,000 direct jobs and 139,000 jobs in related services associated with the port. We might see a jump in sugar and sugar related product prices due to this closure because of the Domino Sugar Refinery, which is a key manufacturer located in the harbor, which takes raw sugar into its plant there and then refines it into other various products at that location. Now I'll address food prices and problems a little later in this video, but suffice it to say that this port closure will result in a significant economic blow, even as products are routed into other ports and substantial losses are avoided. Now the solidly built bridge, it couldn't be expected to sustain a direct impact from a container ship, which is a challenge likely shared by most bridges worldwide. That really reveals a deeper problem, the fragility of our supply chain. And with a heavy reliance on international trade for essentials ranging from food to medicines stemming from single source manufacturers thousands of miles away, incidents like this underscore the vulnerability of our systems. And while such occurrences, they're rare, the recent Suez Canal blockage really highlights the potential for significant disruptions that raises questions about our preparedness for multiple simultaneous crises and the need for proactive measures. They are already indicating that this year's hurricane season could be quote unquote explosive. So it's reasonable to assume that this could hinder port traffic on the Eastern seaboard more than usual. Now we're already seeing a significant increase in cyber attacks and ransomware. That's exemplified by the colonial pipeline attack. But unfortunately, we also live in an age where weapons of war are built to destroy entire coastlines. And while some scenarios are extreme, it's worth noting that any combination of events could lead to a catastrophic problem that requires a much longer recovery effort than Baltimore's rebuild. And it's essential to acknowledge the true impact of this bridge collapse. You need to pay attention to its effect on the economy, the flow of goods and services, and even the prices of goods that you purchase in stores. 
then you really have to consider how multiple port closures for any reason could significantly complicate matters. You really have to assess both your vulnerabilities and your level of exposure. How reliant are you on these fragile supply chains? And is there anything you can do to reduce your dependence upon them? Really decreasing dependence and enhancing self-sufficiency, as we always teach you on this channel, will always be your best course of action. So what do you think? Do you anticipate being directly impacted by this port closure? If so, how? Let us know in the comments below. Cyber attack warning. When it comes to assessing vulnerabilities and proactively determining solutions, there's no threat that really looms larger this year and beyond than cyber attacks. Since January of this year, Microsoft has reported ongoing attacks from nation state sponsored hackers with daily attempts to infiltrate critical systems and escalate control over vital information. Dubbed the Midnight Blizzard, this attack has significantly intensified in volume and methods such as password sprays by as much as tenfold in February compared to January 2024. Now, this known attack is just one among many occurring more frequently that really highlights a more significant concern for undiscovered threats. The Biden administration recently cautioned states about cyber attacks on water systems, citing ongoing threats from hackers associated with Iran and China. Concerns were raised by the EPA and National Security Advisor regarding disruptions to clean water supplies and the significant cost to affected communities, with vulnerabilities in the water sector making it a prime target for cyber attacks that has prompted federal efforts to bolster cybersecurity practices. And while crucial, drinking water is just one of the many systems that are enduring near constant attacks, with state-sponsored cyber attacks probing vulnerabilities across critical systems like power, telecommunications, and banking that really underscore the need for improved defenses as attacks from Russia, China, and Iran are expected to escalate in frequency, severity, and complexity. And look, it's essential to recognize the potential for seemingly minor vulnerabilities to cascade into major system failures, emphasizing the importance of user vigilance to prevent hackers from exploiting weak points and security measures. Now look, I compare this situation to having a wolf at the door. We can't entirely prevent the wolf from reaching us. Instead, we rely on guards at the gate to keep them out of our neighborhood. However, we can take steps to ensure that we don't inadvertently invite them in by keeping the door locked. And hackers often exploit vulnerabilities caused by careless users, such as using weak passwords or neglecting 2FA or two-factor authentication. And by the way, if you don't have that installed on most of your systems, you should. I do pretty much on all my sensitive uh, data. And just one simple oversight, it can grant hackers access to a system that really allows them to explore and exploit further across layers. You need to hear these warnings as they're being given from governments, businesses, and software developers almost every day, and you need to act appropriately. For starters, don't dismiss the warnings and think that they can impact your life. They can. I would encourage you to download our guide on protecting yourself from cyber attacks. It's a free guide. In cyber warfare, it's going to increase in frequency and impact on you in the very near future. At the very least, again, download our guide to ensure that you are prepared. In that guide, you're going to find both little and big things that you can do right now to protect yourself against what will be inevitable as these attacks increase. I'll also drop a link to this free guide in the comments and description section below if you want to check it out. So while on the subject, I think it's a good time to introduce our sponsor. Thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this limited ad video. Each day as you browse the internet, you are unknowingly providing vital information that can easily be tracked. Your IP address and location, which your computer or phone provides, are recorded when visiting websites. Hackers can piece together enough location history from your IP address to uncover where you live, work, shop, bank, and interact with friends and family. Surfshark VPN allows you to get around this problem. Without it, a hacker, government, or algorithm can harvest chunks of your personal information that can be used against you. Surfshark also enables virtual online travel worldwide, unblocking streaming platforms and ensuring safer online experiences. With their VPN, you can make it appear you're in another country, allowing you to bypass geographical blocks and government restrictions. There's no risk in Surfshark, and by signing up, you'll see how easy it is to set up and use. Visit surfshark.dills forward slash city and enter coupon code city for an extra three free months. Surfshark VPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee policy, a great option for keeping your information and location private. Check out the link below to add that essential layer of security today. Viruses. 
There's another virus other than the cyberkind that could impact our lives shortly, and that's the latest strain of the H5N1, highly pathogenic avian influenza. Now, one of the signs that we watch for in a potential zoonotic virus leap to humans is a jump to mammals. We saw that with H5N1 in sea lions beginning in 2023. Now, the virus had spread to marine mammals such as sea lions from wild birds, and it has been attributed to mass die-offs with evidence of a multi-species outbreak demonstrated by genetic analysis revealing nearly identical strains in multiple species of the sea mammal. Now, Brazil's state of Rio Grande do Sul confirmed 942 deaths of seals and sea lions from H5N1, and the CDC reported sea lion deaths surpassing 5,000 in Peru as of last year in April. Now, most alarmingly, we are seeing this outbreak in dairy cows here in the United States. Federal and state health officials, they confirmed on Monday that dairy cows in Texas and Kansas They've contracted H5N1 with unpasteurized milk samples from at least three farms containing the virus, alongside positive results from a throat swab test of a cow. And meanwhile, cows in New Mexico, primarily older ones, have been reported sick, showing symptoms such as fever, reduced eating, decreased lactation, and thick, discolored milk. However, officials and scientists have emphasized that the milk supply is unaffected. We've also notably seen the devastating effect of H5N1 in the poultry and egg industries. So should we be worried? While I personally don't drink unpasteurized milk, I'm not too concerned about it from a health and human safety standpoint. As I mentioned before on this channel, my degree was in microbiology. I graduated from the University of Texas a little over 20 years ago. So I've got a basic enough understanding of what's going on, enough to at least not be too worried that we're gonna see a massive COVID-like outbreak in humans at least, fingers crossed, not anytime soon. And I can say that for several reasons. First, the impacted dairy cows, they've been older and mostly recovered after about 10 days. And second, this is not a new virus to us humans. It's not novel. A novel virus is a virus that is newly identified or discovered, often one that has been or hasn't been previously known to infect humans or has emerged in a new geographic area or population. These viruses, they may pose unique challenges as they can potentially cause outbreaks or pandemics due to a lack of immunity in the population. But H5N1 is not considered a, no a novel virus. It's a subtype of the influenza A virus that's been known for several decades. Look, H5N1 influenza virus, they have been circulating in birds, primarily poultry, for many years and have occasionally infected humans that do cause severe illness. But we humans have both some natural and some vaccinated resistance to it. So it's not likely to spread or mutate to a spreadable infectious level enough to force us to lock down or anything like what we saw several years ago. And look, our animal friends, whether that's fowl or animals like cows and goats are more susceptible to having problems. And that will continue to impact our food supply for some of the most basic forms of protein that we consume, things like milk, eggs, and meat. And it's reasonable to expect that we will see jumps in prices in all of these in the present in the near future as H5N1 continues to spread. And look, there is always the possibility that a mutation and transference of the virus could, and I use that word, that word's doing a lot of heavy lifting here, it could occur in the future. But as I have said, humans have some natural protections against it, and we're not packed by the hundreds and thousands together in tight spaces like modern food production facilities tend to be. And look, it's something to definitely watch. And I assure you that any opportunity that companies find to raise prices in the face of a threatened demand, they're going to occur. And you might already be seeing that. Are you seeing another spike in milk or eggs at your grocery store? Let us know in the comments below. Giveaway. For this week, we're going to give away a windproof camp stove. Now, due to recent changes on YouTube, I can no longer access user uh, emails off your about page. So what we've done is we've shifted our winter selection process in-house to protect your privacy. And to participate in the giveaway, all you have to do is just simply comment on the video down below, give it a thumbs up, and complete the giveaway form linked in the description and comment section below. Rest assured, this information will only be accessible to our team. And using a random selection tool, we're gonna to choose a winner from the comments and then reach out to you via email that you provide on the submitted form. So congratulations to last week's winner, Danny Likens. We hope you're gonna enjoy the two-person emergency survival tent that you won. Food price increases. In 2023, egg prices soared to a record-breaking high of approximately $7 per dozen in certain regions, driven by a combination of inflation and a severe bird flu outbreak. 
but still, they gradually stabilize back to typical levels by midsummer. However, we're about to see those prices go up again due to another severe outbreak of H5N1 that's coinciding with rising demand for eggs during the Easter holidays, significantly impacting supply and causing a spike in prices. Now, the duration of this increase will depend on whether poultry and egg farms can get ahead of the virus outbreak. Now, additionally, milk prices will rise due to inflation and more expensive feed, and depending on the extent of the dairy cow outbreak of H5N1, the mere news of this outbreak circulating through mainstream media will likely result in further price escalation. And when discussing eggs, milk, or poultry meat, it's important to consider the raw form on shelves, existing inventories, and other products that are made from these raw ingredients. There's also a severe spike in chocolate prices that's anticipated. That's directly resulting from a fungus stimulated by excessive rain affecting cocoa production in major producing countries like Ghana, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Now, recent severe dusty seasonal winds from the Sahara have obstructed the sunlight that's needed for bean pods to grow. As a result, exacerbating the impact of the previous season's rotting disease caused by the heavy rainfall. Now, consequently, exports from the Ivory Coast, the leading global producer, have declined by a third in recent months. And the citrus industry is also continuing to face challenges as inclement weather and citrus greening disease, for, for which there is no cure, continue to devastate this sector. That's really preventing fruit from ripening fully and leading to the death of citrus trees within a few years, leaving some growers with no option but to cut down their trees in the coming years. You might have also realized some sticker shock if you've gone to buy olive oil recently. I know I did, even though I alerted you of this problem with Spanish and Italian olive production in a video just last year. Now, two liter container has jumped in price from $19.99 to $32.99 in just under two years. The brand I buy, it went from 17 to 27, and I realized when I shopped earlier this week. As you can imagine, I was shocked, even though I covered this and warned you about it over a year ago. And while the olive oil, eggs, poultry, citrus, tomato, and chocolate shortages can all be attributed to natural viruses, funguses exploding out of excessive periods of rainfall, or other nature-related causes, there are also economic decisions spiking prices. Droughts and fires, they've reduced pasture lands and forced ranchers to downsize their herds, reducing supply. Bridges collapsing in Baltimore, as we mentioned earlier, could result in a spike in sugar prices. And there are many other natural man-made reasons for the coming food increases. And amidst natural causes and intentional decisions by producers, factors like inflation, greedflation, and shrinkflation, coupled with challenges in food supply production and distribution chains, really suggest a looming food supply crisis that's further complicated by ongoing geopolitical struggles, leading to foreseeable price hikes that extend beyond just political administrations. And look, realizing this reality, focus on core prepping fundamentals is crucial. You need to ensure access to food, water, and shelter and assess your ability to survive for three weeks, three months, or even a year if the food supply chain continues on this downward spiral. And you need to consider whether you produce or you're gonna grow some of what you consume or are you prepared to do so? As this problem, and let's be honest, is unlikely to dissipate and may exacerbate and really offering a hedge against inflation as preparedness lessens the impact of rising prices. And look, while the news can seem overwhelming and the image that it paints of our future is a little more gloomy than we would like. Again, as I always say, there are solutions that you can implement today to reduce your overexposure to failing infrastructure or food supply chains. What I'm personally doing is picking up gardening. I've got a lot of cleaning. Uh, I did not do a lot of planting last fall, so my garden has fallen into a state of disarray, so I gotta go through and clean that out. We had a lot of rain over the last few months, so weeds have taken over my garden. So I'm gonna be working on that over the next several week, cleaning it up and getting things ready to plant. We're gonna be doing some videos here on the channel soon to get you started on your planting. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, for the last few years, I've been shopping land. And one of the problems in our area is that when COVID hit, land tripled and this is not just unique to our area in some places i know people in texas they've seen it quadruple so 
what happened was land went way up. Now the sellers are no longer able to sell at the price they're asking for. The, mar the houses are, or the properties, not houses, but the properties are sitting in the market for a year or more. And so they're now beginning to drop. I'm starting to see fire sales in some of the areas I'm looking in. In other words, I've seen some properties drop by as much as 50%. I went and shopped one piece of land uh, Tuesday, a couple of days ago, and it has a well, 10 acres. Um, unfortunately, the area that I looked in, the area that I can afford, and it has a lot of water, it's a heavy weed growing area, which the problem is it brings in a lot of uh, crime. There's a lot of uh, theft. So I'm finding good properties or rather nice properties at good deals. But the problem is I can't build and secure anything there. If I set up solar or a cabin or anything else, it may not be there the next, the next week I come back to check on it. So I'm having to shop in different areas and it is a struggle. The other issue, if you've probably seen in places like Florida and our state here in California, we're seeing insurance triple, literally triple because a lot of the carriers are backing out of the state due to the fires. Hurricanes are in Florida, so they're having the same issue. And then, of course, with interest rates, I mean, I could go on and on. The point is the prices have jumped, and so I'm having to reassess how I'm moving forward. We're picking up sponsors in order to fund these projects because my goal in this next stage of my prepping evolution is to learn off-grid uh, survivability or rather to develop an off-grid setup so that I can use it as a teaching platform to teach gardening, animal husbandry, you know, uh, off-grid power, water, all these things that I've wanted to do at a larger level. I can do some of it here in my suburban neighborhood, but the level to which I want to go is going to require land. So all that to say is I'm currently shopping it. And again, I've talked to my realtor today and I said, look, I need about 30 days before I make an offer on a piece of land because we've got some contracts with some of the sponsors to do some pretty big uh, projects for the channel this summer that we're excited about, but they're gonna require land. Um, and by the way, side note, I usually kind of explain every few weeks just my journey of physical uh, preparedness or physical fitness. I, in January, released a series of videos encouraging and showing practical steps to uh, get physically fit. And I've been implementing it. I'm two and a half months in. I started at 178 back on January 15th. I'm now down to 162. I was 187 last August. So I'm down 26 pounds, 25 pounds, 26 pounds, 25, 25, 187 to 162. So all that to say, it feels amazing to be healthy, eating healthy food. And it's funny because we call it healthy food. And we're so used to eating process and sugar that anytime we eat healthy food, people are like, what's going on? Why are you doing that? It's just, it's called eating normal. And so cutting out sugar and alcohol has made all the difference and it feels amazing. So again, once I get down to my ideal weight, I'm hoping within the next month or two, I want to shed about another seven pounds. I'll share the journey here on the channel and uh, what that's been like. So um, again, one of the videos I did at the beginning of the year is I started off with saying, what is the most important thing that you should do this year? And that video points to physical fitness. And I will continue to echo that here on the channel. I've had a few people in the past tell me, hey, your channel's not about physical fitness. You need to stay on this. I disagree sharply. I can think of no other greater value as a prepper than to have your health, especially if we continue to see these issues play out as we're talking about here. Your ability to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and to be active is going to be contingent upon your physical well-being and so i can't encourage you enough if you are not taking that serious please do so and one of the things i will always say on this channel over and over and over is no matter how bad things are getting none of us are victims as we see decay as we see collapse whatever you want to call it i personally i try to stay optimistic but i'm a realist at the same time and i see the world in front of us not with a negative view, but as much as an understanding of what is happening. And I can see these things like you play out. And it is in my best interest and yours as well to prepare yourself. Again, we're not victims here. We have time to prepare. And this is why I enjoy this community so much, because I choose to be like you proactive. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, go check out some of our videos. I'll post one here on the side of the screen on building a three-week emergency food supply. If you're new to this channel and you're like, well, I don't know where to start, start there. Get, take action, get some food ready. That's a simple one. You can plug in solutions today to get you ready. And look, the future comes with a lot of uncertainty, but you can certainly position yourself to be more secure. As always, stay safe out there.